Yeah, and even especially people that you think are crazy or people that you disagree with, it's good to read their stuff. It's kind of like like conspiracy theories. I love conspiracy theories. I love reading conspiracy theories because it, to me, it's a lot like it's a lot like watching television. Like when you watch television, you sit there and go, "This isn't real," or do you just allow yourself to be entertained by it? Yeah. yeah, and that's how I treat conspiracy theories, and, it, and it's a really good practice because it's kind of like watching like a, like a mystery movie where you're trying to figure out the ending or trying to find the plot holes or find the problems. I do that with conspiracy theories. I love it. I, I would imagine there probably aren't very many that you can mention that I don't know a lot about because rather than watching television, I'm like, oh, let me see what they have to say about this one. I don't know. Are ancient Sumerians, are they aliens? You know, were the, uh, were the pyramids actually spaceships and all, this, you know, all these kinds of things? And it's not that, that again, that I, that, that I justify. It's not that I agree with it or think it's true. It's I want to understand. <clears throat> I want to understand what makes, it, what makes a Ted Kaczynski a Ted Kaczynski. Because I recognize that there's a monster in Ted Kaczynski. And as we talked about before, there's a monster in all of us. And so if I can recognize what went wrong in Ted Kaczynski, well, then you can recognize those kinds of things in your own life. Not necessarily that you're going to start you know, sending mail bombs to, the, to, to, to Elon Musk. Don't send mail bombs to Elon Musk, right? Yeah. You've all heard me say it. Um, but you recognize that maybe the only reason you're not doing that is because you don't know how to make a bomb. In other words, maybe there's something in you that if you're so angry, and you're so bitter towards towards society and towards you know, towards even just the, the towards it being in existence itself, and there are these people who will do that. Yes. Did you ever find out about his professor um, conducting his Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. There's actually a really wonderful um, docu series on Netflix about him, and there's one episode specifically that deals with with what he encountered at Harvard under, in, in, through MKUltra. And there's this really neat thing where it shows as, it, you know, as he um, went through the experiments and then towards the very end, it kind of runs this really fast like, montage together of all these things that went wrong. And then it like, goes boom and it shoots to a picture, like a, a video of him just kind of standing there. And you kind of get the idea. It explains how is it that this could have happened. Again, not that that, that caused him to do it. It's like he made his own bed, but but God damn it, that professor brought him the sheets. You know, and that's the way it is a lot of times in life. It's like we're responsible for the things that we do, but geez, you know, we wouldn't have been, we would never. But yeah, you know, we can understand why Prince, even if we don't have to, to justify it, but if you look at, at Prince's, you know, how he, you know, how he grew up and, and all that, you can see it, you can understand it. You know? That's why it becomes so dangerous when we look at people like, like I just read that Pablo uh, Picasso, that people are trying to sell off their Picassos because, and well, people are trying to get people to sell off their Picassos because of his, because of how he lived his life. They're saying, you know, he was so immoral, he was such a bad person. It's like, well, yeah, that's what made the art. Of course, I think I made, I told you last week, I think it was, that I was reading that, that article about him and a quote from him was something to the effect of, of Women are, uh, women are either goddesses or doormats. And that's how he treated them. There was only these two extremes. So he had a horrible relationship with women, obviously. But then you look at the art and you're like, yeah. I talked before about Chris Brown. And, you know, and, you, and, you, and it all kind of goes back to the same thing. You can understand why people do the things that they do. The problem is a lot of times we cross over into justifying it. And we say, well, it's okay because of that. It's not good. Um, but it's easy for us to condemn it. You know, it's easy for us to just look at it and go, and, and you'll notice that we use the word that it's weird, it's strange, it's odd. We use these phrases like they're insults in and of themselves. Like to be any of these things is off the bat so that there's something wrong. You shouldn't be these things. You know? And then the funny thing, of course, is that most of you are strange and weird and odd. And we're just reassuring each other that our masks of identity are on straight every day. You're being, it's like you'll tell someone, oh my god, you're being weird. It's like you're letting them know, hey, you're, you know, you're being yourself. You need to stop that if you still want to hang out with us. Oh my god, yeah, you're right, I'm just being weird. Let me, let me conform and come and hang out with, with you all. Yeah. So, it requires less effort to condemn than to think, to, under, to, to understand why. But again, we have to be very careful not to confuse these two. And a lot of times when you do this, 
you start to do this just by birth, just by nature. Like, um, have any of you guys ever seen the, the YouTube channel Soft White Underbelly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't look at it. Soft White okay. Underbelly. Yeah, don't go watch that that YouTube channel it's called yeah. Soft White Underbelly. <laughs> <laughs> The reason for it is because uh, what it is, it's a guy who, who takes a camera and he, um, he sets up, it's all in black and white, and he interviews people from Skid Row. And just name a, a type of person that you think you'd find on Skid Row, that's who he interviews. And the people who, who he talks to seem, I mean, he has a way of asking questions and letting the format go on for a while, where these people get to really talk about who, who they were. So for example, there's a girl on there, I can't remember her name, I should remember her name. It's horrible that I don't, but that's part of the point. What's that? I just told you not to look up soft white underbelly. My goodness. Why would you have done that? It's because you said not to, so like it made us want to like go look at it. Do not do your tis fasts today. What's Your poems? Okay, do not do your poems today. <laughs> Yeah, it, but it, you, you, by the way, you, you all get it. You should go see it because they talk to these people. Like I said, there's one woman, I'm trying to remember her name, but um, she was a, a prostitute and a drug user. And she was, they were, they were talking to her, and, she, and the interview kind of begins, and she says, I had a great childhood. And I had no complaints about it. And she's talking about her childhood. But as the interview goes on, it, it, within like, a, actually, not even as it goes on, within a couple of minutes, she mentions that one of her first memories of her father, her father wasn't really around. And she remembers her father kidnapping her and taking her out to, a, to the mountains and trying to sacrifice her. And then she was rescued. And it's like, you had a great childhood. Your father thought he was Abraham. He tried to sacrifice you. And her father was, you know, so now you kind of realize father probably suffered from schizophrenia or something like that. And that means that there's a good chance that perhaps she inherited some of those genes. And then her whole life, she, she explains what happened. And there's this one point where she's crying and... I mean, I, I wasn't. There, I had some dust in the room or something. I think mm -hmm. I remember there being there was some construction. And I wasn't crying. You were probably crying. <laughs> but she's crying and she's just like, and she's saying, no one gives a fuck about me. No one gives a shit about me. Why should I give a fuck about the world? No one gives a shit about me. She's just going on and on. And she's, and she's saying it with such intense anger. And, she's, and you sit there and it's like, you, you, you can't be human unless you want to go find her on Skid Row and say, I care. But she wouldn't believe you probably. You know, because there's something in her. And you can understand why she does the things that she does. But that doesn't mean that we have to say it's okay to do it. But you see how, especially in a situation like that, you can sit there and go, this line gonna, is going to connect more over... Okay, we, we're going to... The understandability starts to, starts to encapsulate the justifiability. You know, we're, we, we even will say, well, let me, get, let me fix it for you. Let me, let me find a way to, to make it okay. You know, we do this, and it's, it's, it's normal, it's natural, it's very human, and there are a lot of interviews on that channel. There was one of them that I was, I was watching that was just like, hey, god damn, man, just, the dude needs a break. And he was talking about how he was, um, he, he was, I think he was from Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, and he was kind of taken into a, to a, to a, to a car, oh, it actually was just a drug gang at the time, and he talked about having to commit murders as a, as a teenager. And then he's able to escape it, though. His family was intervening and everything, so his family kind of kidnapped him, and, and, he, and he escaped. They brought him to the United States, and he was explained that he was here illegally, but that he, and, but he was able to, to, to get a job, and that because of that, he was able to get off the, the drugs. He was using drugs just to kind of cope with the fact that he had to kill people as a, as a, as a kid, and he, kill, he had to kill two. And as he's talking about it, you can see it's not like the whole, I did what I had to do. He feels horrible about this, and you can see him almost like reliving the trauma. So he explains that he he ends up uh, he comes to the U.S. He gets back on drugs, then he gets off of them. Um, someone came along, and gave him an opportunity. So he got a job at a, at a restaurant, and then he was able to use that to get a job at another restaurant. So now he had these two jobs, and uh, he had a girl, um, and she got pregnant, they had a baby, and he's working these two jobs. And then COVID came along, and he lost both of them because and he was wiped out. So of course, what did he say he did? He turned right back to drugs. And of course, then the, the woman kicked him out and said, I can't have this around me and my, my baby. Can't do it. And so he's, he's homeless living on Skid Row. And he's trying, and he's, and, and he's, kind of, and he, and he's just saying, like, it's hopeless. I, I don't see any way out of this. 
you know? And you can just sit there and look at that guy and go, this guy's going to use drugs until he dies. This guy's going to die this way. You know? And How, how far does this bleed into this, you know, on something like that? Well, you want the same thing. You want to go find the guy and dust him off and, and give him a job and make everything right. And he was, and he was just saying the only, the only sense of hope that he had was that he was trying to get off the streets so that he could straighten things out with the, with, with, with his, with the, with the woman. He said, I still love her and she loves me, but I understand why she's keeping me away. I can't be, you know, she can't have me around that in her family. And so <clears throat> he said that he would go visit once in a while and she would... Just kind of say, if you can stay clean just for a few days, even, you know, just so you're clean when you see when you see our baby. She was trying to work with him, and he was just saying, but though that the demons were just, great. yeah, were just too great. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know whatever happens to that guy, but those are the kinds of stories that you see on, on soft white underbelly on YouTube. And I keep repeating it because I do want you to watch some of them because they help you to understand people. The difference between a lot of those folks and some of us is just that they don't have a support structure. They're on the streets because they didn't have people who care about them as much as maybe you have people who care about you. I just found out that a friend of mine, yesterday I found out a friend of mine is in hospice. And it breaks my heart that she, uh, she didn't reach out to me before now, but she's 28 years old. And um, she's, she's in hospice. She's dying. Liver disease. Liver damage. A lot of alcohol. She was a significant alcoholic. I mean, at 28 years old, you think about how much alcohol she had to have. But it's terminal. She's not going to survive it. She's, she's there to die. They're just making her comfortable at this point. You know? And I know her past. I know her life. And I'm going to miss her deeply. I'll say that. But where those lines go is very difficult for us to propose, especially when we know people. And it doesn't even have to mean that you personally know people. Maybe even just seeing those interviews with people will, will make us uh, better with that. So... Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? Happy Thursday. <laughs>